the uh, notes for this, and this is a two-part. Um, do you think the children should go? I thought this was a pretty good message. I, <laughs> boys and girls, my wife really is trying to get out from... <laughs> These are our honored guests, our little ones that are going to grow up, hopefully, in this church. We started with this two weeks ago, and so I need to, uh, to kind of go back and weave it together for you, because we want to finish this particular text in Acts chapter 19. I'll read that to you in just a moment. But we are... Seeing in this the idea that there are, there are two groups that are contrasted in this passage here that Luke records so faithfully in his historical record of the transitional period of the early church. On the one hand, we see some people that tried to manipulate the grace and power of God. They tried to use God. And I know that sounds crazy, but... I think that's still a problem today of people trying to capitalize or, or to uh, monetize spiritual things, especially ministry. And then there was the example of the Apostle Paul who, uh, in the midst of this, and he's just serving pretty much, he's, it's just Paul, you know, it's, he's way outnumbered, but he is got a whole different motivation. His, his goals are different. His methods are different. And he is not trying to use God. He is really seeking to be used of God. Now, of course, the point of all this for you sitting here with us in this place or listening to this later on or possibly live some, from some other location the point for us individually comes back to this. I hope this is somewhat obvious. You, have a, you can live either of these directions. Any of us here, young or old, we all could seek to try and put God behind our will for him to do what we want him to do. Or we can fall in line with the all-knowing, all-powerful, all-wise God and we can just simply say submissively, Lord, your will be done. I want, by life or by death, I want to serve you. And that may be an easy thing to say. It is a tough thing day by day, hour by hour sometimes to follow through on, to live out. And I know that some, sometimes all of us will waver between these. But here in this text, here's the passage today. This is... Isn't it amazing how the Word of God can be 2,000 years ago written, or older, if we were in an Old Testament passage, and yet the Spirit of God knows how much we, what our needs are, how much we need truth, and how relevant this can be for daily living in Iron County in the year 2022. So we're looking at God using us versus, or us using God versus being used of God. So let's read the passage. We're going to see that this is kind of got some standout things in it. I'll try to point them out a little bit. First of all, there's miracles here in this text, but they're not just normal miracles, as if there's such a thing as a normal miracle. But the text specifically says that this was even for Paul. These were extraordinary. These were special over and above miracles. <coughs> Let your eye find in chapter 19, verse 10. And you follow along. I want to read to you verses 10 through 20. This took place for two years. That is, from the previous verses, Paul is teaching young men doctrine in the middle of the heat of the day. He's been gathering these individuals who have been saved and are wanting to grow in truth. He's, he, this took place for two years. Here's the result, powerful and amazing as it is. So that all who lived in Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. So this is Asia Minor. I will be, well, let me see. I got this map here. You see the orange area toward the center of the screen 
It had the seven churches of Asia in it. It's a very, today this would be, I think, primarily Turkey. But there's a, this was, you know, launching across the uh, Aegean Sea. You get over to Achaia and Macedonia, the yellow and green on the far left. And that, that's, these are the primary areas. There's the region of Galatia, this, just this side, where there was some early church work planted. But the, the, key, the key churches of the New Testament are Asia, Macedonia, and Achaia. So God was performing extraordinary, look at it, extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul so that handkerchiefs or aprons were even carried from his body to the sick and the diseases left them and the sp evil spirits went out. We're going to talk about that. But also some of the Jewish exorcists who went from place to place attempted to name over those who had the evil spirits the name of the Lord Jesus saying, I adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preaches. So they're trying to use God with the phrase that Paul was using with power. Seven sons of one Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, were doing this. So evidently there were more examples of it, but this text follows this one example, this one group. And the evil spirit answered when they tried to use this verbal formula to cast out the evil spirit. The evil spirit answered and said to them, I recognize Jesus, and I know about Paul, but who are you? Now, oh, that's scary. And the man in whom was the evil spirit leaped on them and subdued all of them and overpowered them, so they fled out of that house naked and wounded. This became known to all, both Jews and Greeks, who lived in Ephesus. And fear fell upon them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was being magnified. Many also of those who had believed kept coming, confessing, and disclosing their practices. And many of those who practiced magic brought their books together and began burning them in the sight of everyone. And they counted up the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord was growing mightily and prevailing. There's only one other time in the record of the early church in the book of Acts where there was this heightened experience of, of extraordinary, unusually Powerful workings of the Spirit of God, miraculously healing and working in people. And that is found in Acts chapter 5. I'm just going to mention it, chapter 5, verses 15 through 16, where Peter performed miracles for a brief period, where even the shadow of him, I mean, as he would walk through Jerusalem, his shadow and people were just being healed every, almost every day, everywhere he went. It was just a, a massive Powerful working of the Spirit. And this passage, and I am so tempted to dwell on this because it's so significant in our day and time. This particular passage has become a popular one with word of faith or faith healing individuals, especially tele television evangelists or individuals who are sensationalists. And they are doing things with handkerchiefs or things through the mail as a means of raising significant amounts of money. But in the Bible, it was only for the apostles, apostles of the, the, had been directly commissioned by the Lord Jesus. And the purpose of these miracles, note this very clearly, was to confirm and authenticate their message. Prior to us having the completed New Testament, and therefore the full revelation of God, the canon of the 66 books we call the Holy Bible. How were people to know, especially as the gospel was spreading into these unreached areas, how were they to know that what these individuals were proclaiming about Jesus Christ was the truth? Confronting their paganism, their, their, uh, their idolatry, their immor immoral worship, 
that they were doing in, in their various uh, perverted forms of worship, how were they to know this was the truth over everything else? These miracles performed by these individuals were the answer to that. that according to Hebrews chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, it says, After it was first spoken through the Lord, it was confirmed to us, the writer at that time says, by those who heard, God also testifying with them both by signs and wonders and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. This is in great contrast to today's miracle workers, sign gifts people who claim to have the same gifts and, uh, and are going around and, uh, and I should say flying from place to place in their private jets <laughs> and, and often doing, doing things that they claim. And I am not going to name any of them. I think you're probably familiar with a lot of these kind of people, but um, I, and I, I just want to mention it in the introduction and passing. <coughs> Miracles throughout the Bible only occurred in three particular periods. I mentioned this two weeks ago. It happened at the Exodus. We had the 10 plagues. And again, that was to confirm God's messenger, Moses. It happened during the ministry of Christ. And what was the purpose of those miracles for him? It was to confirm to the places there around Jerusalem and, and Israel and Samaria and so forth, that he was indeed the promised Messiah, the Christ. It was to confirm the message of the kingdom through him. And then we have in the early church, the apostolic period of the early church, and it was again that way. When they died and the Bible was complete, history shows that this all kind of just went away. And the, the, the power of the word of God is now the evidence of the Spirit of God's working. You want to know how to change? You want to know how God to do powerful things in your family and in your life? Get in the book. Apply and understand the book. Put God first. It is a powerful thing. All right. I did it. Now, <clears throat> two weeks ago. Oh, here's. Let me put some arrows up. So this is the third missionary journey. It starts over here in Antioch, over in Syria. It's where the first Gentile church, and that's where the first missionaries, Paul and Barnabas, were sent out, then later Paul and Silas. And now he is over here, far away. He's worked his way up with that upper red line, and he is now back in Ephesus. Ephesus was, no, was a major population and also major worship center. This is a, a very realistic reproduction model of the temple of Artemis or temple of Diana it went by both names. It was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. It literally took more than a hundred years to build this magnificent place. What was the purpose of this place? It was a pagan demonic worship center. The goddess Diana or Artemis was a goddess of fertility. It was a place sort of like Corinth's, the one that was on the hill way up above that the thousand prostitutes would descend out of that area every night and go down and, and look for visitors and businessmen and citizens of Corinth. They would worship. <laughs> this was the same kind of thing, only a lot more in town. This one was close by. There was a temple. I mentioned this last time. This was fascinating to me in all my studies. It's the first time I knew this. And it fits with our text. But this inside this temple was one of the prominent idols was the, the idol of the goddess uh, Artemis. And on the, that idol was some words. And they believed. And this explains in our text. This sheds a lot of light on why these guys tried to use something they heard Paul say in a, as a magic formula to powerfully do something in the spirit realm. And it didn't work. But they had the idea that certain people could not only know the phrases to say, but exactly how to say them. And so you could, they put it on the base of this, this uh, idol, this, this, uh, goddess idol 
This, and we have found evidence of this. Archaeologists have found evidence. But it was all in the way it was said. So you would hire people that were supposed to have the ability to put the right inflections and to say it the correct way so that these would unleash the power from that phrase and people would be healed or demons would be cast out or whatever. And I believe that there is power. If you don't believe in a, in a literal Satan, you're wrong. The Bible's very clear about the forces of Satan and the kingdom of darkness, and they have power. And so it was altogether reasonable that these people could go around representing uh, that false worship system, and Satan at times would, would do powerful things with, with some of these guys, and they would, of course, collect a lot of money for this. But then Paul comes to town. And he's not concerned about a magic formula, a certain phrase, an incantation that's said a certain way. He's got a living relationship with God the Son. And when he would encounter someone, he would simply, getting out of the way, say, Lord Jesus. Or in the name of our Master, the Lord Jesus, I'm asking that this person, you know, you, your will be done with this person be healed. And it was happening. Extraordinarily, it was happening. And these seven sons of Sceva, this, I, there's no record of a, of a Jewish chief priest by that name. So he probably just took that on as part of his franchise and to, uh, you know, have some kind of a, of a document or something that was giving him some sort of credibility. And uh, they, went, they went and tried that. Didn't work. In fact, it backfired and they, they, they were really beat up and embarrassed. And it was a bad, a bad result. So the first thing that we noted was this. <coughs> we should not try to use God for our own purposes. And one of the things we looked at two weeks ago... Um, we're, we're, we saw three ways that we are prone to do this, to use God for our own purposes. And I filled in the blanks on your bulletin that were on two weeks ago as filled in as blanks. But there are two considerations that I just want to mention, repeat again. First of all, that we already have, we're already blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. If you only could grasp and become confident in the truth of God's word that's proclaimed in Ephesians chapter 1. Where you are when Satan or his host try to look at getting to you, we are in Christ, seated in him in heavenly places. And it goes on to say, far above all principalities, power, and every name that is named. In other words, for Satan to get to you or me, he has to go through Jesus to get to you. Don't be afraid. The biggest tool that Satan has is ignorance and fear. Knowing that that's true, but you denying it makes you vulnerable to something. And I've seen it many times when people, you know, were thinking that demons were attacking them. I'm telling you, the Bible is clear on this. And we could talk, if you have, if you struggle with some of that, Let's get together, let's look at the word, and let's claim this reality. The second thing that I wanted to mention is behind this group of people that are trying to use God for their own purposes really is the core central issue of who is the Lord in their life. Young people, I, I know that you're not the only ones that struggle with this. We all do. But we want what we want by nature. We want the control. We want to direct you that are graduates right now from high school and you're on the verge of something in the future, I would highly appeal to you. Make it over and over your direct words and your heart's desire. Lord, not my will, but yours be done. Right now, some good verses for you would be Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. That you would trust in the Lord with all your heart and don't lean upon your own understanding. But in literally all your ways, acknowledge him. And he promises that he will direct your paths. Who is the Lord? 
these false guys were wanting to manipulate God. They wanted that role. They wanted to be the Lord. They wanted to direct. They wanted God to endorse their agenda. That's a big problem. The Lord will not work with that. So there are three things we saw then. There are three ways that we are prone to use God for own purposes, and then we'll jump into what we have to finish this passage. Those are, first of all, we try to use spiritual power for financial gain. Well, that's one of the ultimate things, isn't it? That is about money, money, money. Money is power. Get what we want. These individuals were trying to capitalize as if this was something that was all about the right words. And so they were trying to just, and they apparently, from what the evidence is, is that they had other incantations that they would bring up at other times for other situations. And, and this one, they had not seen these kind of results. And so it was like, whoa, we could use this. And they tried to just pull what they heard Paul say on occasions into their repertoire, into their arsenal, their toolbox of gimmicks to go in, and they had no idea the realm that they were dealing with until they were confronted. We don't know you. And so they, were, they suffered for it. The, the second thing that when people try to manipulate God for their own purposes is they try to twist the scripture. I've seen this many times in trendy things that come into the church. There was a book about 20 years ago or more. I guess it had to have been more because it ruined my home church. There was a book that came out that was all about pragmatism. And it was trying to teach pastors and their staff how to bring people in how to grow a church. And it was using pretty much marketing techniques. It wasn't about biblical principles and the power of God. And I'm going to tell you that for some, if they, if they use these things, it could attract a crowd. If that's what you're after, it could do it. It was one way of doing it. But I noted when I was looking at the book that they, would, they were not really explaining passages. They would grab phrases and Verses, sort of just picking and choosing. And if they didn't like it in one translation, they keep looking for some obscure translation somewhere that would give it what they wanted to say. They're responsible to God for that. They were manipulating the scriptures to get their end result. Let me read to you from, from Ezekiel. This is not going to show up. I didn't put this in the, the verses from, for this week, guys, back there at the media desk. But... Out of Ezekiel 13, verse 6, listen to this. So it's in the Old Testament, and it's the same principles that God was saying then is still true. Speaking of false prophet, they see falsehood and lying divination who are saying, the Lord declares when the Lord has not sent them, yet they hope for the fulfillment of their word. Isn't that something? They want the Lord to do their thing, and so they will put it and say, the Lord said this. That does not work, and it is a dangerous thing to do. If you're going to teach the Word of God, you're responsible. What does James say about the accountability of preachers and teachers? We are more accountable, and believe me, this weighs on me every time I'm preparing for a message. Is that truly what that passage was about? And so... We have come into a time right now when pragmatism is a big problem. I'm going to read you a quote. Pragmatism is whatever works, whatever brings desired results. Pragmatism is flooded into the American evangelical church. We use marketing techniques to draw the crowds to our churches. We tone down the difficult parts of the gospel and emphasize the feel-good parts so that we don't scare off potential converts. We avoid difficult doctrines and give shorter messages, sorry about that, that focus on how people can succeed in life, because that's what people want to hear. We use psychological counseling and 12-step groups instead of submission to the Lordship of Christ 
to help people cope with life's problems because these techniques seem to work. Pastors flock to conferences that share the latest messages that are proven to build your church. Sounds a lot on what these seven sons of Sceva were trying to do. It works. Let's try it. Thirdly and finally, before we get into today's portion of it, I just want to say that we are trying, this is a dangerous thing that we are trying to use God for our own purposes. And some people, because it is powerful, they will dabble in the occult. There are games, there are activities. And if you think this is not popular today in our young, with young people in the world, it is extremely popular. There are certain things that have been around for a while, and then there's other things that might come along with new, new labels on them. But they are substitutes and dangerous ones at that for God's working. Young people or older people, be careful. Do not dabble in the things that are truly on the dark side, Satan's, Satan's group. There's a thing called white magic. That is, Satan is not opposed to using the word God or even the names of the Trinity if it will get people to follow in his direction. And it doesn't stop there. The people that I've dealt with that were tampering with that kind of thing later on, that it kind of migrated into more dark things. Don't even experiment. Don't dabble in this. Let's go on. So having seen how people try to use God for their own purposes, now let's look at the text for the rest of this. This is the positive side of this. We should allow God to use us. Make yourself at his disposal to use us according, not to our will, but his will, not for our benefit and notoriety and glory, but for his glory. The first, <coughs> the first thing I want to mention about this is Paul's example. Paul is the one in this text that Luke is so faithfully giving us, he's tracking with Paul as the servant of the Lord that teaches us these principles. And Paul was a lot like John the Baptist. John the Baptist was getting tremendous popularity. People were following him out in the middle of nowhere for massive crowds. And God, he was one of the most powerful prophetic speakers ever that lived, according to what Jesus said about him. And here we have Paul saying some of those same kind of things. He's trying to magnify the Lord and not about him. It's not about Paul. He's trying to point people to Christ. He's not trying to get people to, to, to just follow him. In verse 17, notice what it says. It says that fear fell upon them all and the name of, not Paul, but the name of the Lord Jesus was being magnified. That is, a, that is an easy to overlook thing. It, you know, in churches today, I think in churches where e even the pastor's trying to promote scripture, he's trying to make clear the text, it's easy for people to give the credit to him. I'm going to John MacArthur's church. It's, John MacArthur would be the first one to tell you, it's not his church. He didn't die for it. He didn't indwell it with the Spirit. It's God's church. It's Christ's work. And I could have used any number of people as an example of that. Look again at verse 20. This is Paul's example. So the word of the Lord, not the word of Paul, was growing mightily and prevailing. This is, this is Paul's example. Turn with me to, first, or to Philippians chapter 1. <coughs> Common verse. But Paul in this passage is really bearing his heart to the Philippian Christians, the church, the church in Philippi. And he's sharing his motives. Verse 18, I'll start, says, What then 
only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in this I rejoice. Yes, and I will rejoice, for I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayers and provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectation and hope, that I will not be put to shame in anything. And then, then listen to this, but that with all boldness, Christ will even now, as always, be exalted in my body, whether by life or what? Or by death. This was consistently Paul's motivation. His purpose is clear. This is the example that is set. This is a good thing for us to follow. It's clear. Now, there are four qualities of those that God uses for his glory. And I'd like you to note these things. All four of them are here in our text. Note these qualities so they're here for us to not just say, oh, that was good back then. These are things that are still good characteristics of ministry, Christ-like living, this is the way it should be. It's going to be the way it is until Christ comes. <coughs> and we see this exemplified in this particular passage. Quality number one. We must be people of integrity. Subject to his will. I've gotten to the time in my life when... Because I'm older, people sometimes who had been in our church and now are somewhere else and they're struggling in a situation, they may call back and ask about a, a deal that they're dealing with where they live now. Or, or guys that are in ministry and they're struggling with something and they don't know who to talk to locally, so they'll, they'll call me as, as one of the people that they'll call for counsel. I... I feel quite inadequate because I think that sometimes where you live, getting all of the input, you know, is kind of important. It's hard when you're separated from distance to know all the factors in order to give good advice. But sometimes it's not hard. Sometimes it's cut and dry. This thing about people of integrity, this is just an example I want to give you that really happened. Someone that had been very involved in Valley Bible Church moved away. You can try and figure this out, and I'm not going to let you do it. <clears throat> and uh, they were involved in a, in a starting church, a church that was starting up somewhere else back east. And they had been there for a while. And the church they were in, this pastor was, was well-trained. He was giving good Bible messages, and they were thrilled because that was harder. They went to several places. They couldn't find that. They were finding a lot of topical and fluffy, surfacy messages and and so they found this, this particular thing, and they were thrilled. And they got more and more involved, and they became more of a critical part of the team, somebody that you could really count on. They made sure it was a priority for them to be there, and they took responsibilities, and they were going on. And then I got this call, and they were saying, Tom, let's go over some of the financial policies, how churches handle money. But where in the world is this coming from? And I said, okay. So I gave them the things that I think should be large church, small church, brand new church, old church. Doesn't matter. These are, there are certain things to, to make sure that no one is falsely accused or that no one is tempted or that no one actually does succumb to the opportunity and take money that's been given for the Lord's purposes and trusted to a ministry. So I went over a few basic principles that we have tried to incorporate here, and I said, what are you asking this for? What's going on? And they said, well, we're trying to talk with this pastor, but when the offering is collected, he puts it all in his coat pocket, takes it home and counts it alone. We don't know how much came in. We don't know where the money's being spent. And he just says that 
not to ask him any questions. What do you think about that, Don? Yeah. I mean, that's pretty obvious, isn't it? That is not integrity. I mean, he may not have touched a single penny of it. But what if someone accused him? How in the world can he demonstrate that he is innocent? That is wrong. If you are interested, I would be happy to share with you the steps that have been put in place here for counting the money. It's never done alone. And it's all, I mean, there are certain specific steps that we have put in place because this is a service that people are giving of their time. You know, long after you've left and you're probably finished with lunch, there's people often here that are very carefully counting and putting the deposit slips together and putting it in a tamper evident bag and getting it ready to be deposited. And I want to tell you that are doing that, thank you. I can't do that. I don't want, I'm not involved in that process. I don't, it's important that I'm not involved in that process. Back to the text. Turn with me over to Acts chapter 20. This is a, we're going to come to this soon. In Acts chapter 20, the Apostle Paul has come back between where we are right now when he's in Ephesus. He's going to leave and he's going to go and visit some of the other churches and then he's going to come back. But he's not going to come all the way to Ephesus. He's going to come and he's going to meet with the leaders, the elders of the church at Ephesus. He's going to meet for a very emotional, uh, very emotional meeting together. And that's what this passage in Acts chapter 20 is about. Paul says to these men. I just want you to picture it. I mean, they're, these are men that dearly loved Paul. He had probably led most of them to the Lord. And now they've taken responsibilities in the church, and they, they're meeting with him knowing they've just been told that he probably they'll never see his face again. This is their last time to see him. And there's a lot of tears. There's a lot of emotion. And he has been admonishing them. These are sort of like his last words to church leaders. And this is a great passage. When we get to it, we're going to really, uh, this is a, a, will be a good one for our church. I want to begin at verse 32. He says, Paul speaking to them, he says, Now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Now look at what he says next. I have coveted no one's silver or gold or clothes. Wow. Paul was able to say it, and it had to have been true because the Spirit of God took those words and put them into the eternal, his eternal word. That was not just some words that he wanted to say. That, those were truths about his motivation. He goes on to say in verse 34, you yourselves know, because they had watched this over the years, you yourselves know that I, that these hands, and I can just picture him as he's saying this to them, that he's holding up these calloused, wrinkled, uh, swollen, knuckled hands. Old Paul, he's saying, I, you know that these hands ministered to my own needs and to the men who were with me. Paul had the right to be supported by the church in Ephesus, but because of people misunderstanding his motives in comparison to other people's forms of ministry, quote-unquote, and lack of integrity, Paul said, I don't, I don't want there to be any doubt. So he, he worked extra long hours, used his skill in leather and tent making, so that he would earn the money to support his food, his rent, and the people he were, that were companions traveling with him. They knew it. 
He had the legitimate right to be supported by his labors in the gospel, but he refused to use that right so that there would be absolutely no question, no hindrance to the gospel. Now, what about these handkerchiefs or these things? These were actually sweatbands. And this is, these were really, I think, I see these things way different than a lot of the televangelists that have sent this little scrap of paper that had maybe a little bit of a sweat on it. Or I don't know, maybe it was clean. I've never gotten one. My, my grandmother, bless her heart, she was swept away by this kind of stuff. She, and she would, to great frustration of my grandpa, she would send in money to these guys every single time. Poor Viola. But these things that are mentioned here were actually, Paul didn't plan for them to be used this way. When he was working in the shop to make the tents or to do the leather work, it was humid. It, it was, he would sweat. So they would put, just like today, you'd put a handkerchief or something over your eyes so that when the sweat would come down, it would kind of saturate that. And then you could take that off and rinse it out and it would be cool. Then you'd put it back on your forehead. How many of you have ever done that? Working out in the garden or doing something? The rest of you don't work? <laughs> These were, these were essentially sweatbands, handkerchiefs. The word here talks about they were sweat cloths. They were things that he tied. They were maybe used as handkerchiefs, but he'd tie them up here. Or the apron that he would wear. So you can just see, Paul comes back into the shop after a night of ministry. He's been teaching at the, at the, at the school. Comes back in, he goes... Now, where did I put that apron? It was probably somebody in the church going, well, I know what happened to it. I'll keep you supplied in aprons because they're being put to good use. People were taking these things, and it wasn't because of the innate power in them. It was because of the, and they represented the hard work and integrity of the apostle. And as they would go, as they would be taken out, people were trusting in the message, not in the method. But the message of the apostle and people were being healed in a in an over the top, extraordinary kind of way, as the text says, whether with his work apron or his or his uh, sweatbands. In great contrast to that. I don't know if you've ever heard of this. I did hear of it, especially from my dear, sweet grandma, Viola. But they would send her, they would send her a little piece of fabric. And they would say, we want you to take this and we want you to write a, to write a little thing about what, what miracle you need in your life. And then we want you to Put this back in an envelope, but don't forget to put some money generously in there and send it back to us. And when we get it, we're going to take this and we're going to just labor over this. And we're going to like they had the ability that you didn't have to reach God. But you be sure to send us money and then we'll do this. And you ever heard of that? Any of you heard of that kind of thing? That is not what happened here. There was integrity. Paul was one of the dear men that I love reading, Ray Steadman. He had a great testimony. He was, in, he was in the California. He had a ministry amongst street people and the hippie culture and stuff like that back when. He said this about this. He said, these sweatbands and trade aprons were symbols of the honest, dignified labor of the apostle, his labor of love and humility of heart, his servant character, which manifested and released the power of God. God means to teach that by this, that is through a man whose heart is so utterly committed that he is ready to invest the hard, diligent labor in making the gospel available. 
willing to stoop to a lowly trade that the power of God would be released. That's the point with this integrity. You know, even the demons indicated that they recognized Paul's integrity. They said, we know Jesus and we know Paul. I bet they did know Paul. They said, we don't know you. They have no power over a servant of God, not just a pastor or an apostle, but over you if you are honoring Christ. Secondly, a quality that for those who really are putting God first, they want God to use them for God's glory, is that we must demonstrate our faith through repentance. Did you notice that here? And let me read it again to you. <clears throat> After this situation where these men got beat up bad by that evil spirit, and the word got out about that, and the the name of the Lord Jesus was being magnified. Look at the result. There's, it's very important, the, the context of this. Verse 18. Many also of those who had believed. Okay, so we're talking about people in Ephesus that had trusted Christ. They had made a public confession of Christ. Kept coming, confessing, and disclosing their practices. What does that mean? And many of those who practiced magic brought their books together and began burning them in the sight of everyone. Here's what was going on. There were people that heard about Jesus and they said, man, that's incredible. Grace of God, free salvation, my sins forgiven. I don't have to do these, uh, you know, I mean, these other things that I've been relying upon. This is but what they were doing is synthesizing. They were bringing this in along with what they were used to. And they had a backup plan, apparently. If this doesn't work, I still got my old stuff. <coughs> you know that there are Christians that you wouldn't, you wouldn't know. You see them on Sundays. You see them around when they're ready to be seen. But they've got stuff from their old life. They might have magazines or they might have books or they've got something that is from their old practice. They've not repented. They've not turned away from that to Christ. They've kind of tried to keep a hand in both camps. I've been to summer camps where this passage was taught to young people and they would start weeping, coming forward, openly confessing and saying, you know, I've got a bunch of music that's super dishonoring to the Lord. This was back in the days when you young people, you don't have any idea what these things are there. There was these discs that we called records. They weren't. And there were small ones that were called 45s. And then we had the big ones. They were called what? All the gray people are talking now. You see that? <laughs> or then there were these things called eight tracks. I never had that. Then they had smaller ones that were called cassette. I had that. And you could record on them. Or you could buy them and play those in the car or in your room. When headphones, if it wasn't good music, so your parents couldn't know how. And you know, Satan has his, has his music. Satan has his entertainment. The world has more of that available than the Lord's side does. You can hear stuff and you might say, ah, it's just music. It's doctrine. It's values. And you know the strange thing about music? I'm getting way into this, man. <laughs> the strange thing about music is that it takes thought, words, and when it's combined with the right melody and harmony and rhythm, it puts that deeper into the soul of the listener. 
And if you don't think that that's true, you need to read what some of the most famous musicians from the world, they know it. They can move people in any, it's like they can manipulate a crowd with the, with the songs that they want to play. Do you know that music can do that, but in a good way? You can take the, the words, when the words are preeminent and they're truth, they're scriptural, and the message of the music is compatible with those truths, it will go into you and it will do this. It'll lift you up. If you're getting depressed, one of the things when people come to me and they say, I am so depressed, I go, what are you listening to? What kind of things are you feeding your heart? And what they did is they took these books. It's pretty impressive what the text says. They brought their books. So they're now coming clean. They're opening up and they're, and it may have just started with one or two people. And the other said, you know what, that's what I need to do too. And they had this big old public bonfire and they brought these books. And you think, well, that was sweet. You realize when, listen, look at what it says. They found that the price of these books was 50,000 pieces of silver. If these were drachma, a drachma was one average day's labor. You worked and you got a drachma for a day's labor. In today's economy, now this is quite broad. What, what, what currently is the starting wage here in Cedar City? 14? How many say it's more than 14? 14? What do you think is, after you've been working for a place and you're starting to be like full time, what, how, where does it go to? If you're a laborer, not an owner. Would you, well, let me look at my notes here. Would you let me calculate this in a span between for, for just to get an average, but I, I, I gave, I'm going to give you a span between $15 an hour and $25 an hour, because I know that in construction, it's not unusual to get $25 an hour. If you've got a skill in construction, if it is, if it is that this is the assumption, then that many pieces of silver would amount to, in today's wages, between 6 and $10 million. You say, wow, they could have built a pretty nice church campus with that. Yeah, if you would have converted it back into a Satan system and let other people get the ruination from it. No, these people really did confess and turn away or repent from this, this garbage, this stuff. They said, no, we're going to destroy it and we're going to do it in a Christ honoring public way. And they brought it out and, the, and people kept coming in and, and they were taking these, these very, ex, obviously very expensive books that had all these magic incantations and all these spells and things that were part of their old pagan lifestyle and they said, we do not want any part of this anymore. And they would throw it in. They were demonstrating their faith and their repentance. And I just wonder, follow me. I just wonder how many of our people have still got one little secret stash of something some practice, some music, some websites, something that is not commensurate with the purity and power of Jesus Christ in his church. And I'm telling you that there's a relationship in the text. What is the first word of verse 20? Look at it. So that is a word of result. What was the result of this repentance of turning and 
throwing away, turning their back on, saying no more to these pagan things, ungodly things. What was the result? Verse 20. You get it? So they demonstrated it. That's number two. And thirdly, for God to use us, we must seek to magnify the name of the Lord Jesus. It said this over and over. Paul was so different than these exorcists, these sons of Sceva, and any of the like, those like kind of guys. They were all about Christ, not him, not about the name of their church. It was just Jesus Christ. We want you to know about Jesus, the resurrected son of God that came from heaven, lived a sinless life, died on the cross without having any sin of his own, died so that you might be forgiven before a holy God. And he rose again. And now you can have fellowship with him. That was who they pushed all the time. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Let me tell you, if you're talking to folks, do not get caught up in what the name of the church is. Do not get caught up in, in us. Just push Jesus. Fourthly and finally, <coughs> The real power is in the truth, and there is no greater truth than to proclaim God's word and the gospel. It really does amaze me. Why isn't this the way that it is always done in churches? Why don't people, why don't pastors spend the time to study and to pull the text out and present? What does the text say? Let it just say what it says. And the gospel. It says the word of the Lord was growing mightily and prevailing. You know why it was growing? Because it was being told. That's what that means. Now, just to be clear, the Bible doesn't, listen now, the Bible doesn't directly connect. Well, sure, it was growing because there were all these extraordinary miracles. No. The extraordinary miracles were getting people's attention. And then Christ was the one that was, and it was his word that was what was being promoted. And there are several examples. I'll just tell you that the, the text, and you can, you can see that this is biblical. Miracles do not always result in conversions. You know that? For instance, when Jesus did one of the greatest miracles of his whole career of publicly rising Lazarus from the dead, did everybody fall on their face and say, we repent, Jesus is the son of God? No. In fact, you want to know why Jesus was crying? Because he knew the hardness of their heart. That's the shortest verse in the Bible in the English. Jesus wept. And why do you think he was crying? He knew he was about to raise Lazarus from the dead. So why was he crying? Because he saw the hardness of people that even if he raised him from the dead, they would still. And the text, you look it up in, in uh, John 11. They then go from there to some of the people witnessing that went to the Jewish authorities and tried to tell on Jesus. And they didn't believe him. They, tried, they were trying to rat on him. <clears throat> in Acts chapter 4. There were people that saw the miracles that were happening in that, in that earlier part of the church. The, the, uh, when Peter was before the Sanhedrin, and there was the man standing right there that had just been publicly you know, gone from being a, a permanent invalid. And they knew it. They knew that man. They knew he was miraculously healed. They dismissed Peter and the others from the room. And they said, what are we going to do? This is going to be a hard one for us to explain. This guy just got, but we, we, they didn't like losing the popularity. Miracles do not bring people to Jesus all the time. But the word of God does. The word of God does. Sometimes miracles do bring people to Christ. For instance, in the island of Cyprus, 
when they went around in that proconsul, the man of Sergius Paulus, you might remember back in Acts chapter 13, Paul was doing miracles, and this very educated man who was the leader, the public government leader of that town and that area, that region, it brought him to Christ. But that, that's not always the case. Let me finish this. Is God still doing miracles today? Yes, he can. Is there the gift of healing? I don't believe so. I believe the gift of healing was a New Testament thing to authenticate the apostles' ministry and message. But prayer can work. And there are lots of stories about it. I, it's hard to know what maybe would have. It's sort of like vitamins. You don't know if, how it would have turned out if you didn't take the vitamins. You took the vitamins and now it works. And you don't know if it was the vitamins or not. Maybe you got better slower because of the, I don't know. It's not real scientific. But I can tell you this. There have been times in my life when my son, Tommy, was two years old and he was dying from lack of oxygen. You can bet I, the only thing I could do was commit him to the Lord. <laughs> And the Lord delivered him. Everybody in that hospital knew the Lord delivered him. We've prayed for people. And I believe the Lord has done some marvelous things. But it's not up to an individual whether he's going to put his hands on this person and heal them and not on that person. It's not that way. The emphasis of this text, and don't miss this. You are not in charge. You, have, you and I must submit to the Lordship of Christ. We must promote the word of the gospel. We must be faithful no matter what trials come, no matter what happens. It is about putting Christ first in your life, your home, your church. That's what's important. I trust that this will drive home. And if there's something that you need to go home and you need to get rid of it, you need to, you need to get it right. Don't, don't compromise. It doesn't belong there. You say, it doesn't matter. It's just, just music. Oh, I think the Lord knows where your heart is. Be single-minded. Be pure in your devotion. Would you pray with me? Father, we... We've been challenged. I've been challenged by this particular passage. And I would just simply ask, Lord, that you would work through us. Not that you would work so that we get the attention. But that you would work in such a way that Jesus Christ gets all of the glory. That the word of God is what we pay attention to. And Lord, we know that there's a lot of different ministries out there. We've not named any by name, but... We know that there are a lot of people on television and it's a different kind of thing. We'll leave them up to your working with them. They're accountable to you. We're not the judge. But we do want to make clear the word of God and try to help people be able to sort these things out. Father, I pray today that you would help us this week in the simple task of day by day putting Jesus first, letting him be the Lord, the master of our lives. For it's in Christ we pray.